Hello, I'm George Page. Natural history filmmaking is a very specialized craft, and on Nature, we try to bring you the world's best. The camera people who make our films are a special breed, but even within their specialty, there are specialists. And this week, you'll see the work of an outstanding cinematographer of birds, cameraman Michael Richards, who provides stunningly beautiful scenes of birds doing one of the things they do best, and that's building their nests. This is a robin's nest, one of North America's most common, built by that red-breasted member of the thrush family, the famous first harbinger of spring. As common as it is, if you look at it closely, it's a remarkably beautiful creation. Its shape is almost a perfect hemisphere, produced by an intricate weave. Inside, there's a thin plaster-like coating of dried mud, which would be lined with soft, downy feathers and grass, at egg laying time. And as delicate as it might appear, this handsome structure is strong. It's architecturally sound. In short, I think it's wondrous that a robin could construct something at once so simple and so complex. But the robin is a bird, and a close look at how birds create their nests reveals them as master builders. Since the dawn of time, all animals have sought to protect their young to ensure their survival. Birds coped with the world's harsh, unrelenting environment by evolving the nest and indulging in a high degree of parental care. An important reason for such behavior was that birds are warm-blooded. Eggs need brooding at a constant temperature. From the moment they hatch, nestlings must have warmth and a constant supply of food. Most reptiles, however, don't need this care. They also put their eggs in a shell, but it's not as hard as a bird's. Few reptiles show any brooding behavior or care of their young. They leave the eggs in some secluded spot to hatch by the heat of the sun. When birds evolved from reptiles some 200 million years ago, the nest solved many of the birds' breeding problems. Today, nests are built in a bewildering array of shapes and sizes. High in the trees like the great spotted woodpecker, or almost submerge, like the dabchick's floating platform in the middle of a lake. Wherever they're found, nests like the plumage and behavior of their owners are perfectly adapted to their surroundings. The European nightjar's nest is simple, just a flooring of leaves. The nests of other species are far more complex, the work of true craftsmen. One step up from the European nightjar is the lapwing. It's a bird of the open field, found in Europe and North America, and it needs a better nest than the nightjar to protect its eggs from the chilly winds of April when it begins nesting. At first, the lapwing's nest is no more than a scrape in the ground, which the birds scour out with their legs. The female does most of the work. But occasionally, the lapwing stoops down and picks up sticks and stones, pieces of dead leaves, grass, and other debris, and then flicks them behind with a toss of its head. This action probably derives from the lapwing's feeding behavior. Inedible scraps are often rejected with the same sideways head flick. Here, 
here, the movement has another purpose. Gradually, the pieces of leaves and grass build up around the brooding bird, forming the wall of a simple nest. Set safely inside this protective thatch, the eggs remain untouched by the wind, especially when covered by the parent's warm breast feathers. But cold is not the only problem for a nesting lapwing. Other animals can cause concern too, in this case, sheep. The female is unhappy. The sheep are coming her way. Their sharp hooves could cause serious damage to her eggs. She calls an alarm, but the sheep graze closer. She raises her wings in threat, trying to appear larger and more formidable to the sheep. Then she charges distracting attention from the nest. The danger's over. A quick preen, a ruffle of her feathers, and she can return to her eggs. The owners of these eggs, common terns, don't have to worry about sheep. They nest on barren sand dunes and islands. What they do have to worry about is other terns. Competition for nesting sites is fierce. Each pair stakes out a territory where they lay their two eggs. They defend the nest area vigorously. The nest construction is much the same as the lapwings, and the terns build it in an identical way, picking up grass pieces and flicking them over their bodies. Both sexes share the chore of incubation. They very rarely leave the eggs uncovered for long. Gulls and other predators would soon snap them up. While common terns protect their eggs by their physical presence, the shoveler duck is a master of the art of camouflage. This female is nervous on the approach to her nest. She won't go near until it's absolutely safe. And her senses tell her that there's something close by in the reeds. She moves forward to investigate. It's just a lone red shank searching for food. The female relaxes. The shoveler's nest is hidden deep in a grass tussock, close to the water's edge. The duck has added a new refinement to the gentle art of nest building, feather down. Only the female incubates the eggs. The shoveler drake is too brightly colored for nest duty. He stands guard where he can see, but not be associated with the nest. It's the female who provides the warm insulating down, plucking the feathers from her breast and making her nest as cozy as a comforter. Dried grasses pulled in with the beak still form most of the nest. The shoveler also uses the living grass around the nest for aerial camouflage. The brown and white streaked pattern of the female breaks up her outline in the dappled light of the tussock. When she stops moving, she becomes invisible to all but the most alert predator. The swan could never adopt such a nesting strategy. It's one of the largest water birds, too big to hide. This is the male, or cob, recognized by the black bulbous knob on the top of his bill. 
the female, the pen, is on their almost completed nest. The swan doesn't even attempt to hide its nest. Instead, it seems to try to intimidate potential nest robbers by its sheer size. Though the nest is more than 100 times the size of the lapwing's nest, it's constructed in much the same way. This time, there is a division of labor. While the female sits on the eggs, the male collects reeds and passes them behind him with the same twist of the head that the lapwing in turn used on their nests. The sitting bird collects the reeds and stacks them around herself with a similar movement, making the nest even more bulky. It needs to be. The swans must ensure against the risk of the water rising in the lake. The nest isn't always so large. Its size depends on the amount of material surrounding the nest area. In drier conditions, there would be less building material and the nest would be smaller. wetlands like this, there's no lack of vegetation. The swan's instinct is to keep on collecting, so the nest just grows and grows. Though they are still building, six eggs have already been laid. The female incubates for about 38 days, only leaving the nest to feed. When she does, the male takes over her duties, but normally he keeps guard nearby. When they hatch, the young are fluffy balls of down. They stay on the nest for a day or two and then follow their parents into the water for their first swim. From the beginning, the cygnets feed themselves, though the female does pull up water plants, crushing them slightly to make them easier for her babies to eat. Both parents keep a close watch on their young, protecting them against disaster. Away from the water's edge lives a bird that nests neither on the ground nor on the water. Trees can help to deter some predators, such as foxes and rats. But here, wind is also a problem. Eggs can be blown away. The nest belongs to the wood pigeon. It's a pretty basic structure, an eight-inch dish of twigs and sticks nestling in the fork of a branch. It's late July, and the bird's two eggs have just been laid. This is the female. She does about three quarters of the incubation. The male does the day shift, from 10 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. The nest itself seems quite fragile, but its appearance is deceptive. The twigs are firmly interwoven to form a robust, stable platform that can last for years. This is necessary because unlike the swan and lapwing, young wood pigeons are helpless when hatched and depend on their parents for food, warmth and protection for almost a month. The parents sit on the eggs for 17 days, rarely leaving them unattended. Despite their care, many wood pigeon eggs are stolen by jays, magpies and other predators such as squirrels. When the survivors finally hatch, 
They are fed by regurgitation on a unique diet, pigeon's milk. It's a cheese-like substance produced from cells in the parent's crop, an ideal food for the growing bird, rich in fats and protein. After hatching, both parents are working full tilt to collect food and bring it to the nest. While the male waits, the female is busy regurgitating food to their growing offspring. The chick's beak irritates the lining of the adult's crop, triggering delivery of the partly digested meal. By now, the menu is a porridge of pigeon's milk and corn seeds. Most wood pigeons time their nesting so that hatching coincides with the ripening of cereal crops, which does not endear them to farmers. Seven days later, and all the parents' hard work is paid off. The flight feathers are nearly fully developed, and the chick is almost ready to leave the nest. Its parents are now feeding their infant only once or twice a day. When the food finally turns up, the chick really lets its hunger show. While the parents forage for themselves, the chick, left to its own devices, begins to exercise its flight muscles on the edge of the nest. Watched by its parents, the fledgling moves out onto the branches, away from the soiled nest, now revealing the fate of its weaker brother. Even after it's left the nest, the young pigeon will be fed for some days by its parents. Gradually, they'll withdraw their support, leaving the young bird to fend for itself. Until then, it can relax in the September sun. Rooks rarely relax and never during the February breeding season. They also nest in trees, but higher up in the topmost branches. It's a very exposed position, windblown and blustery. The birds ride the swaying branches like sailors on a boat caught in the winter gales. Calling is an important part of a rook's courtship. Although rooks nest in colonies, Rookeries of 9,000 nests are known. The birds are still very territorial. Pairs defend a small area around their nest and drive away any intruders. This couple is trying to squat on another pair's nest. They're soon driven away by the legitimate owners. The male supplies most of the twigs and sticks that make up the nest. And he also helps his mate with the building. Unlike the wood pigeon's flat platform of sticks, the rook builds up the side of its nest with scores of branches forming a deep cup shape, perfectly designed to keep the eggs from rolling out during stormy weather. 
Often it's only necessary to refurbish the old nest by cleaning it out and adding a few branches. Here, the females decided to help with the twig collection. She jostles her mate aside to make her lengthy offering fit into place. The completed nest is an ugly structure, firmly fastened to the swaying treetops. Inside, there is a second nest, a lining of mud and straw on which the female lays her two brown-spotted, bluish-green eggs. The male feeds the female as she incubates the eggs during the first days of spring. The chicks hatch as the world is waking up in late March or early April, just when there's an abundant supply of food. The male not only feeds the chicks, but also the female. She broods the chicks continuously for the first 10 days. Sometimes she's a little too greedy. This portion's for the chick. Rooks will fly miles to find food. They eat almost anything. They take earthworms and any sort of grub or larvae. They're also partial to cereals. The birds often forage together as a flock, but there's no cooperation among them. After the tenth day, the hen bird stops brooding the young, and both parents help to collect supplies and feed their offspring. By the time they're six weeks old, these chicks will be fully grown. Despite their increasing size, the deep well of the nest holds the young birds safely. Even after they've left the nest, they're still dependent on the parents for up to three months. At about the same time that young rooks first take wing, another woodland bird, the bullfinch, has just begun to lay its eggs. Like the rooks, its nest is really two nests in one, a twig exterior and a delicately built inner nest woven from fine roots and hairs. The female bullfinch looks like a toned down version of the male, but it's she who builds the double nest and does the lion's share of incubation. No one is quite sure why the bullfinch makes this double nest. It would certainly be far less trouble to build only a single layer. The bird nesting at the top of this Scots pine does just that. The chaffinch has dispensed with the bulky outer nest. By investing less energy in nest building, they can put more effort into raising a family. Moss, lichens, grass, and feathers make a delicate cup wedged firmly among the branches. Cobwebs bind the building materials together, giving flexible walls that fit snugly round the eager chicks, keeping them warm. But a small nest has its disadvantages. As the chicks grow, they can easily fall from the tree, especially when they begin to practice flying. The blue tit, a bird similar to the chickadee, has avoided this danger by nesting in tree holes. Unable to climb to the entrance, the infant birds stand little chance of falling from the nest. For the first few days, they are fed mostly small caterpillars. The nest is a simple cup made of moss and grass. 
It holds the chicks comfortably at first, but by the time they're ready to leave, they've outgrown the nest and crushed it underfoot. A tree hole is tailor-made for a cup nest, but one of the least promising habitats must be the long, thin stems of a reed bed. One bird that has overcome this difficulty is the reed warbler. It builds its nest around the upright stems of growing reeds. The nest is still the basic cup shape, though much deeper. The scaffolding that supports it can be tossed about by the wind, so the bird needs this soft cubby hole to protect its eggs and young. Three or four chicks is the usual size of the clutch. Their diet, like that of the adult reed warbler, is insects, plentiful in a watery habitat. The chick's tail wagging signals imminent defecation. The parent collects the fecal sac and prevents the nest being soiled. The adults must always be on the alert. With such an open-topped, exposed nest, even an ordinary summer storm could flood the inside in minutes, killing the nestlings. Brooding is essential. The house martin has no such worries. This attractive bird has learned to build its home under the eaves of houses, where rain is not a threat. It also makes a cup nest, catching small straws and grass stems on the wind and working them into pellets with mud. The nest takes shape as pellets of mud and straw are piled laboriously one on top of the other like miniature bricks. Both male and female house martins work tirelessly to complete the nest. The birds have to carry more than six times their own body weight of mud. It's been estimated that they must make at least 400 collecting trips before the nest is finished and the egg laying can take place. After an incubation of 14 days, the young hatch. They're fed a puree of insects caught by their parents on the wing. Mortality is low among the chicks, mainly because of the nest location. They are relatively safe in their tiny castles of clay. These rooftops in Neusiedl, Austria, are home for another bird that likes to nest close to man. The white stork builds its nest on top of roofs and chimneys, a behavior that's unique among storks. Both parents take part in building these nests from available twigs and in incubating the eggs and caring for the young. The magpie, like the rook, a member of the crow family, has a different way of deterring predators. At first, it builds a rook-type nest, the male bringing in the raw materials, the female arranging them. Then, over the top of the nest, the birds fashion an open-work dome of sticks. The roof of twigs is thought to act as a defensive screen, protecting the eggs and chicks from the unwelcome attention of jays and other nest robbers. It certainly looks very effective, so it's strange that in some places, most magpies no longer build a twig roof. It may be that predators are not now as common as in former times, and building the dome shield is an unnecessary waste of energy. Magpies usually lay between five and eight eggs, but in this case, only two have hatched. A tiny bird that builds probably the most beautiful of all nests in Britain, 
provides the perfect contrast to the sprawling, untidy home of the magpie, the long-tailed tit. Its small nest, just six inches long, is as functional as it is beautiful. The bulk of the nest is made of moss, held together with spider's webs, giving it an uncanny ability to be pulled and stretched out of all proportion without tearing. The long-tailed tit spends a great deal of time nest building. This pair is just adding the finishing touches to a job that has taken them 20 days to complete. The birds cover the inside of the nest with insulating feathers. More than 2,000 have been found in a single nest. The outside is given a coat of lichen pieces held on with extra cobwebs. The lichen makes for extremely efficient camouflage among the woodland trees. Even so, more than 80% of all long-tailed tit nests are destroyed by predators before the young fledge. To see an even grander exhibition of avian homemaking, we must go south to the reed beds of Italy and Spain and search among the stands of willow and poplar. This is the home of the penduline tit, a bird that makes one of the finest built nests in all of Europe. The stirrup-shaped swing is just the start. The female flies off. She takes very little part in nest construction, preferring instead to feed, building up her reserves for egg laying and leaving the male to do the home building. A very important part of the male's job is to collect long strips of plant material and to bind it round the place where the nest and the supporting branch meet. This is absolutely vital to the whole structure. If this point is weak, the nest will come adrift with disastrous results for the eggs or chicks within. As the walls are built and the nest becomes heavier, the male adds further strengthening to the weak point. Soon the main body of the nest is complete. The tough, spongy walls are composed almost entirely of plant down, mainly from willow and poplar, intermixed with seed cases and fibers. When it's nearing completion, the male adds his final female luring touch. He collects any soft material he can find, like these willow seed hairs, and carries them back to the nest. He wallpapers the nest with these warm, soft fibers. But as soon as the female is safely settled in the completed nest, the male deserts her and begins building afresh for another female. Dawn on the East African plains. It's a land of scrub, thorn bushes and grassland and it's dominated by the sun. Temperatures rarely fall below 70 degrees, even in winter.
Most of the time, the trees and grasses are starved for water in a state of semi-drought. But many creatures have adapted themselves to this harsh environment. For example, its long neck and 18-inch tongue allow the giraffe to exploit heights no other herbivore can reach. Native cattle must get their living at ground level. One bird has learned to profit from their lifestyle. The cattle egret snaps up insects that are flushed from the grass by their hooves. The oxpecker uses cattle too. It feeds on the fleas and ticks that plague the big beasts. Both benefit from this arrangement. The cattle lose a lot of parasites and the oxpecker gets a free meal and a free ride. Another group of birds, the weavers, have adapted to the African environment by changing their nest building habits. It's this group that have evolved into the true master builders of the bird world. Weaver birds always build in trees and always in colonies, like these red-headed weaver nests. The buffalo weaver takes this social habit to extremes. It builds apartment blocks, massive communal nests of thorn twigs with many individual compartments, each containing a nest. These nests are empty. Building starts with the coming of the rains and the first glimmer of green grass on the parched earth. The rains also mean a superabundance of seeds from the newly sprouting grass. It's an ideal time for a seed eater, like the white-browed sparrow weaver, to mate and raise a family. Twigs and small leaves make up the raw materials for this weaver's untidy nest. As with most East African weaver birds, the male is responsible for most of the nest building. The rainy season is also a nesting signal for the vitiline mask weaver. This species builds on the extreme tip of a thin branch. It's a defense against predators, such as snakes or monkeys. One weaver species even puts thorns on the outside of its nest to deter egg thieves. The golden palm weaver, as its name suggests, makes its home on the tips of palm branches. Once he's finished building, the male displays on a nearby stem to attract a mate. Often living next to the golden palm weaver, and usually close to human habitation, is the handsome black-headed weaver. This species uses grass strips to make its nest. The male, once again, is the builder. He tears the strips from the living plant with his beak. makes a tear at the base of the leaf he's chosen then pulls upwards until the strip comes away. The green strips are far more supple than dead sun-dried leaves that would crack as soon as they were bent or twisted. They make the job of weaving the nest much easier. he's collected enough strips, he flies back with them to the nest site.
In eastern Kenya, a subspecies of the black-headed weaver also lives near humans, sometimes right in the center of a native village. It's a very prolific species with hundreds of nests in a single tree. Such colonies help reduce predation of the young. There's another advantage. The more nests in a colony, the more females will be attracted to it. But such crowding puts enormous pressure on individual males to find a mate. They're all competing against one another. The first step is to find a likely looking nest site on the colony's tree. The trouble is, very often another male finds it just as attractive. In confrontations such as this, one of the rivals usually gives up quite quickly, but occasionally they are so well matched that a real battle royal is inevitable. Victor takes possession, then sets out to begin his nest building. Palm fronds are especially attractive. The birds use the same stripping technique as the black-headed weaver, tearing the leaf strips from base to tip, though not without trouble from their neighbors. To start the nest, the male takes a single strand and weaves it around the fork of a branch. It's hard to believe that no learning is required for this intricate operation. Yet all this complex behavior is wired into the bird's head from birth. He's watched by several females. They take no part in nest building at this stage they don't even seem interested in the male's efforts. The connecting grass strip is very important. It defines the size of the nest and, when reinforced, will be useful as a perch for further work. Hundreds of palm leaves must be destroyed during the breeding season to supply enough greenery for the whole colony. Each complete nest needs more than 500 leaf strips. Sometimes other vegetation is used. Our male has brought a leafy twiglet to add to the nest. All around him, other males are toiling to complete their own nests. The female seems interested, and all the nearby male weavers start to display, vying for the hen bird's attention. Our male joins in, then he stops, probably because his own nest is still not complete. The only answer is to work even harder. But he's luckier than some. In the colony, there are nests in every stage of completion. This bird is a late starter. He's just attaching the first thread. Others are far more advanced and have the roof of their nest built, but not the floor. It takes our male three more days to reach this stage. He'll be working for at least another four to complete the nest.
every so often he lies back as if to admire his handiwork and see what else needs to be done. It's been suggested that it was by watching weaver birds in action that primitive man thought of basket work. It's easy to see why. The bird really does weave its nest, passing the long strips over and under just as humans weave a basket. Another female. This one seems more attentive. Our male begins a low intensity display, calling and flapping his wings. Other males follow suit, even those that don't have a nest. He adds the finishing touches to his handiwork. Then he lets fly with a high intensity display, pulling out all the stops to attract the female's attention. She's chased by another male, and her intended becomes almost hysterical, throwing himself about on the underside of the nest. The reason's simple. She's landed very close. He has to entice her onto the nest with his display. But all the activity among the neighbors distracts her attention. He becomes even more excited. But she's not interested. Or is she? A quick examination of the interior of the nest from the outside. Then the female crosses the threshold, accepting the nest and our male as her partner. Once this part of the ritual is completed, the female sets off to honor her side of the marriage contract. It's her job to collect the fine cotton-like grass and reed seeds that will be used to line the interior of the nest. She has complete control of the interior decor. He takes a back seat during this stage of nest building. Occasionally, a piece of mud is taken in with the lining. African folklore has it that the weaver bird uses it as a sort of candlestick fixing a firefly to the mud and using the insect to light the interior of the nest at night. Once the lining is complete, the female will lay two eggs. As with the penduline tit, the male weaver leaves the upbringing of the chicks solely to the female. If they survive, next year the young will take their place at this convention of master builders. But birds build their nest for a specific purpose, to protect their eggs and young. The Seychelles, an archipelago of 28 small islands, five degrees south of the equator, and more than 700 miles from the coast of East Africa. This pure white seabird, the fairy tern, is a rare species found only here in the Seychelles and a few other tropical islands. The most remarkable thing about the fairy tern is its nest or rather, the absence of a nest. This is the fairy tern's nest. If you think there's nothing there, you're right. The branch is completely bare. There's nothing on it but a bird. And an egg, rather spherical in shape and balanced precariously in a shallow depression on the branch. The sitting bird is very tame. It will allow humans to approach it and even touch it. There's a good reason for this. It's far too dangerous to leave the egg alone for long. Apart from predators, a simple gust of wind could easily dislodge it. 
the brooding bird is condemned to sit it out. A quick scratch is all that's allowed. Its mate is out at sea, diving in the rich coastal waters for fish, the fairy tern's staple diet. The chick, when it hatches, is always fed whole fish. The parents accurately judge the size required so that the meal is never too big. A neighboring bird waits patiently, swaying gently in the soft tropical breeze as she incubates her single egg, delicately poised some 20 feet above the ground. As it grows, the chick is brought a larger fish. In a way, the fairy tern is the exception that proves the rule. Birds build nests to protect their young from predators and other natural calamities. The fairy tern has less of a problem than most. In this environment, it doesn't need to build a nest. It can deter its few enemies simply by sitting continuously on its single egg. Another remarkable example of adaptation in nature. While birds build their nests to withstand all sorts of natural stresses and strains, they're fragile in the hands of man. That's why there are federal laws to protect wild birds, their nests, and eggs. If our film has aroused your curiosity and you'd like to watch your local master builders at work, the best way is from a discreet distance with a pair of these. I'm George Page for Nature.